So today we are going to see AWS Technical Essentials and this is me Kumar here from Alexi Infotech going to take you through the technical essentials and talk to you about what is the different terminologies Amazon uses and what does that name means, what is the definition of that, it's only those kind of things. Today we are not going to see any hands-on details, today we are not going to dive deep into each of those services. We are just going to skirt the boundary, we are going to see what the name means, what is the purpose and the plenty of details are going to come later and we will be doing a lot of demos online and get our hands dirty. So fasten our seat belts and then let's dive deep into AWS. So for those of you who attended my previous talk, you might be familiar with the AWS mission statement. I would like you to go over it once again. Uh, this is very important uh, in terms of a business point of view or a customer point of view because AWS comes forward and says, I want to help developers, businesses to build web services, sophisticated applications which are scalable and I want you to do all this in my platform. This is their committed statement and they are working towards this goal constantly since 2006. So this is very important because whenever you think that can I do something like this in AWS and you go to the console or dashboard and find out by default that option is not there. And the next thing that you can do is you can call up your customer support and say that I want to do this in AWS platform. Can you help me do that? If it is possible easily, they will help you with that. If it is not possible and if the demand is really good, they can go ahead and set up that feature for you. So they listen to a lot of customer feedback and listening to customer feedback is very important in the cloud business. So they keep on innovating, add more and more features based on customer feedback and help your business grow. So that is why it is always there. You can feel AWS presence whenever you go to the console, whenever you use the chat support or the email support or the phone support when you're talking to AWS to understand the platform itself. If you, uh, I, am, I don't have much experience with other platforms, but in AWS, even for the free uh, level of support, you can have a real human talking to you which is not available in a lot of other, say for example, you do a Paytm or Uber, you raise a complaint, there is no way that you can reach to a human, you talk to them over email and then finally only you get to a human to talk to. But in AWS, even for free support, if you raise a ticket and you can request for two options, either callback or email. And if you choose callback and give your mobile number, they call you immediately. So they would like to interact with their customers and try to understand their problems and solve it. Of course, there's a limit of the technical support you get in free level, but you get talk, you get to talk to a human, and which I feel is very important when you're talking about running your business itself on the cloud. So this is how the entire platform of AWS looks like. At the bottom most layer is the AWS infrastructure layer. Today we will be seeing uh, what this availability zone means, what is this region means, what is this edge location, all those things. How this global infrastructure of AWS comes into picture, how it is uh, put all together and how you can leverage each of them. Built on this bottom layer, that is the global infrastructure is the most functional or core of any uh, cloud service you can say. That is why it is called as foundation services. That is the compute part of it. All the compute capacity is grouped under this compute, whether it is a single server or microservices, or container technologies or serverless technologies, all of them come under this compute group of services. And then you have something called storage, your object storage, your block level storage, file level storage, or you can have archival storage also. All those things are grouped under this storage category. And finally, database as a service, I would say, instead of saying just databases. All of them that is shown here on your screen are database as a service. That means that you can run an Oracle, MySQL, MS SQL, Postgres, uh, MariaDB, and one more is there. So you can run all of them pre-installed, pre-configured for you. Amazon Simple DB is another database as a service for you, which is uh, most simplified form of database for you. You just get a very small instance, very small amount of storage pre-installed and pre-configured based on MySQL engine. Elastic Cache is their memcache and NoSQL. So all of these options are available and don't forget that you have a server also available. So that means that you can take up a server 
and install a rack cluster or an uh, um, oracle uh, just standalone instance also possible so you can have databases as on standalone servers or you can also have databases as a service also when i say as a service it is amazon installs it upgrades it maintains it for you you don't have to do any of them you just throw your data and consume it that's what it is and finally when it comes to the networking you get all the flavors uh, amazon vpc is their uh, logical in group we will see more in detail when we go in uh, depth in the future classes for now you remember that whenever somebody says amazon vpc it is a virtual private cloud and what it can do is it can isolate your network from your neighboring network or it can isolate your network into dev environment production environment test environment or you can have a, a connection between two production environments by doing a connection between two vpcs and you can have firewalls stateful stateless or you can have nat gateways bastion host all of those things are possible by using vpcs so just as his name says load balancing it has a fantastic capabilities now they have improved it in the last uh, three to four months uh, today you can have an amazon load balancer sending traffic to your on-premise server instances also it was not available earlier so in in other words you can have some instances on cloud some instances on your on-premise and have a load balancer in the cloud and distribute your traffic between on-prem and cloud that is possible so there are quite a lot of admins here. So can anyone tell me what port 53 being used for? I can wait for a minute for an answer. It's a DNS. Awesome. Great guys. So somebody knows that. So Amazon Route 53 is the DNS service uh, in the cloud. And if you Google it, you will find out that uh, uh, the Route 53 is the longest uh, highway in the United States. So interestingly, it is a nice uh, service name. Route 53 is the DNS, pro and you can register your domain names there. You can do your DNS uh, traffic management, traffic shaping. Uh, you can do um, you can do load balancing with your DNS itself, geographical blocking also with your DNS. All those things are possible in your Route 53 service. It is one of the costliest services Amazon provides because it has an interesting SLA. Amazon provides 100% SLA for Route 53. None of the other services come with 100%, but Route 53 alone comes with a guarantee, service guarantee of 100%. So there are some additional premium charges. I will keep using the word premium charges. That means that you have to pay a little bit more when compared to the other services when you're talking about Route 53 and this guy direct connect is nothing but if you have ever done vpn for in your professional life or ipsec tunneling that is what it means uh, it is a direct cable from your on-premise data center to your cloud data center or between two different uh, premise locations amazon will lay a cable with a dedicated bandwidth uh, some people might be familiar with uh, black network so that is what it is or black fiber whatever terms you call it it's a direct cable dedicated cable and you get assured bandwidth for that for an extra cost there are different bandwidths available but uh, you can choose and mix whichever you want from 1 gbps to 10 gbps both are possible so built on this foundation services uh, i keep repeating this foundation services because most of the effort happens here in the cloud quite a lot of activity happens here compute storage database and networking and the middle layer is typically where the application developers come into the picture. Uh, they use a cloud front for distributing their media content or uh, static images or website images and all those kind of things. That is what Amazon cloud front service is. When we are talking about uh, application services, um, this is interesting. How many of you are familiar with the MQ service? Anybody? MQ, IBM MQ, or, um, Oracle, MQ. So in other words, if you send a machine, okay, let us talk about a WhatsApp messaging itself. If you send a message to your friend or a colleague, you get a blue tick mark when you send it. When the person reads it, I mean, blue tick mark is when the person reads it. So that means that the message has been sent to the other side, received on the other side, and read and processed. So in the 
server world or an application world when two applications need to talk to each other you are sending a message from application a to application b and what is the guarantee that application b got that message so you need to have some form of a pipeline so that somebody will keep track of each messages and know that message a has been read message b has been read message c has been read and d is not read let me retry sending it or let me try to process it again so that kind of service is what sqs is uh, it's uh, in the conventional world or on premise world it is called uh, ibm mq or any of the rabbit mq zero mq products in the cloud world it is called aws sqs simple queue service and if you are familiar with uh, send mail squirrel mail smtp any of those configurations ses is that exactly same thing but only thing is uh, here you can uh, use it for uh, bulk marketing messages or you can use it for routing only either way you can use that ses it's an email service in the cloud when we are talking about sns it is the same thing the same notifications that you get in your mobile when uh, uber or flipkart or somebody has an offer or a promo code they send you a notification and uh, just remember that that notification is not just coming to you it is coming to some millions of uh, people so you need to have a service from where you can send one message to millions of endpoints so for that you use something like sns service uh, so that is what the application services are simple workflow is nothing but a workflow saying a is completed processing b has to pick it up and then send it to c so you can create a workflow like keep on adding servers and you get a workflow there cloud search is nothing but a search functionality this is pretty new it is not uh, getting much popular but uh, some guys are using it so this is the our big data service that uh, amazon provides elastic map reduce you will not be uh, using it most probably uh, and there are very few clients using map reduce today and there is not much demand for MapReduce itself. There are Spark available and people use Spark, which is running on EC2 itself directly. People don't use Elastic MapReduce. So quickly, can, some, uh, can all of you answer this question with your, uh, yes, I know scripting, I don't know scripting. How many of you can do bash scripts or Windows PowerShell scripts or bash scripts? VB script is also fine. Any script that you have written in your life? All of you in the chat window. Okay. See three responses. Four, five, six. Okay, great. So the reason I asked that question is Amazon provides a lot of SDKs. In other words, uh, standard development kits, uh, software development kits. So you can interact with Amazon with any of these languages, whether it is uh, Java or Python or Ruby or .NET. You can interact with Amazon with any of these languages and write your scripts. In short, if you know Python, for example, you can provision a server copy a database, create the firewall groups, connect your data to your web server and set up your load balancer and your Route 53, everything using your script itself. You don't have to log into your console at all. Nothing, you don't have to do anything at all to come to Amazon itself. You don't have to use the GUI at all. Everything can be done through automation itself. Uh, it is typically like the Linux world. If you can do it through a GUI, Definitely 100% you can do it with a CLI also in Amazon. So in fact, I can put it the other way. There are certain things which you can do only with the CLI. Um, and uh, if you want to do it with your GUI, it takes about 10-20 uh, uh, minutes to do the entire workflow. It will be one command in your CLI, but in the graphical user mode you will have to spend 10 10 15 minutes uh, clicking multiple times here and there taking the input and copying it somewhere else so these are the multiple languages amazon supports for writing your scripts uh, so if you have not done it i would encourage you to go and look at any of these languages which you might familiar or uh, want to learn if you are not sure i would recommend you to go with python because it is uh, quite easy to learn 
So this uh, this is another area where uh, activities happening in the cloud world. People are seeing a lot of automation and scripting happening in this area. So if you ask me to pick an area of focus for you guys, uh, bottom area that is AWS foundational services, you will spend a lot of time, a lot of interview questions, a lot of uh, customer activity happens here. And the next set of activity that happens here, management and administration. So this is quite interesting. I can put it this way. So the first one is user ID management, whether you can integrate with your LDAP or Microsoft AD or just cloud provided um, identification also just like Facebook login it can you can integrate your uh, uh, Google authentication also or create user IDs in AWS itself that is also possible in AWS so that is what it provides there are multiple features uh, anybody familiar with um, role based access control you can do almost similar activities here you can write a code and say um, all the group which is my uh, developers uh, need not have production admin level access likewise my production admin team does not need a database read write access so you can write simple rules like this and then you can deploy them in your IAM um, it, it's a quite a friendly tool there are uh, pre-written rules are also uh, there you can reuse them and customize them and configure them and this is identity federation i told you you can integrate with your on-premise ad or if you are an ibm or, or uh, from other enterprise uh, you can use any of the ldap systems also you can provide a single sign-on or you can find a token based authentication also any of them is possible using identity federation consolidated billing what it means is you are going to have multiple accounts in your company most of the time so it is not going to be only one aws account uh, sometimes people create separate accounts for uh, development team production team and uat team and there will be a, a one sponsor or a one ceo who is going to approve all those billing so for him you want a consolidated bill to be generated so you use this service create a consolidated billing and present to somebody who's going to pay the bills that is what it means uh, this is where you guys are going to spend a lot of time clicking 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 so web interface so this one and this one ties very well together so this is your cli this is your gui in other words so amazon provides by default monitoring capabilities for almost all the services whether it is the server storage network database identity access anything you have a cloud watch service which monitors everything that is happening in the cloud there's another service that is not shown here it is called cloud trail what it does is it is a logging mechanism we will see that when we are doing those classes but for now you just remember that for monitoring there's cloudwatch and for logging you have cloud trail both of them are free uh, for everybody for a certain level for example in cloudwatch if you want to monitor something for five minutes every five minutes it will go and check the cpu every five minutes it will go and check whether your storage is uh, available or not if you want to reduce that to one minute you need to pay some money to amazon so five minutes is free one minute is not likewise in cloud trail you can store all the logs for seven days for free these are all new change and this one is the latest change that has happened after uh, amazon breach so for seven days all the logs will be stored for free if you want to store anything longer like if your compliance requires 365 days the logs has to be stored then you pay some more money on your storage level and then you keep the logs so that is what the two important services in monitoring group so deployment and automation this is a lot of action is happening here i will show you a demo of how to do cloud formation itself i have already written some scripts i'll show you how to write them it is in other words automating your deployment other than writing your python code so you can say this is also possible using python you can write cloud formation scripts but other than that you can use yaml very very simple format yet another markup language it's a notepad file you go ahead and say i want server and server has to have 2 gb of ram 4 gb of cpu in other words instance type equal to t2 micro or t4 uh, nano anything like that 
and you are going to say I want a DNS service with the route 53 pointing to my this IP address of this server. So all those things you can write in YAML format and once you send that YAML format to the service, it will set up this, uh, all the resources for you. So this is the broad level platform. Let us go ahead and look. Uh, if you remember, I didn't see anything about, say anything about the bottom part of it, the global infrastructure, because I have some decent images, which we are going to see now, which is going to explain to you uh, what is the region, what is the availability zone, which will make it more clearer than explaining it here. Let's go ahead and look at the global infrastructure part in detail right now. So, so far, are we good here? This is how the global infrastructure of uh, Amazon looks like. Uh, you might have seen this before or somewhere else. This is the presence of the Amazon data centers in the various uh, continents of the world. So let us take in particular one of them. Just one data center at a moment. Okay, my animation doesn't seem to be working properly. Okay, so you see here uh, all of the data centers are named here. Uh, for example, in Singapore, you can see here there uh, there is one particular uh, circle, orange color circle, which is called as the region. And within that region, I have two data centers. Here, whenever we say data centers in Amazon, we are going to use the words availability zones. So each orange color circle is a region. And inside that region, you are going to have multiple availability zones. So if you see a number two inside that orange color circle, that means there are two availability zones there. And if you see there, North Virginia, let me highlight that on the United States, uh, uh, that is on the East Coast, you can see North Virginia here, and you can also see the number five there. That means that five different data centers are there in that region. So whenever you see this map uh, somewhere in Amazon website or somewhere and you see this green color circles that are pointed out here, that means that new data centers are coming into picture here. This slide is a little older. The India data center in Mumbai has already come online and there are two data centers here. So we have a data center already in Mumbai. So in short, what you need to know is the green color circles are pointers for new data centers and Amazon is building a data center somewhere here now in Iran. So it might come online anytime. So whenever you're talking to your clients, you should be able to tell them that Amazon has data centers in all across the globe and each of those data centers have multiple redundancies available and you don't have to memorize those numbers. You know, it is public knowledge. It is always available and free of cost. So don't try to memorize which data centers are there, how many are there. But just remember that almost all the important financial centers like US, Beijing or Japan or Australia or Europe all have a data centers. As of now, you can see the mark, uh, the African region doesn't have a data center because there is not much business as of now going on here. So Amazon has not found uh, viable to start a data center here right now. Even Brazil, Sao Paulo has a data center, as you can see. So let us look a little bit more in detail into the one of the data centers now. So if my animation works fine, you should be seeing uh, the West Coast now with uh, the Ohio region coming soon. I'm just going to dive into one of those regions now. So you see here a particular region with uh, three availability zones. What it means that each availability zone is on a separate uh, floodplain. That means that all of them are geographically isolated. So a loss of one availability zone will not impact the other. And then the availability zones are all fault separated. That means that each of them are separated completely uh, by substations, that is, uh, power systems are separate, coolings are separate. Uh, in other words, geographically separate. Just imagine them, they are in a different place altogether, but it is in the same region or geographically. If I take a region like uh, Bangalore, one might be in Whitefield, another might be in Basveshnagar, another might be in Pinya. So all of them are in the Bangalore region, but different areas in Bangalore itself. And all of them are connected by a millisecond data fiber cable. That means that if you copy data in one of those data centers, the data are supposed to be replicated to another availability zone. It, it happens in less than one millisecond. 
So that is how the interconnectivity between availability zones happens. Mm -hmm. So the finally they give you some metrics that is 25 TBPS of peak inter AC available uh, traffic is available for you guys. So very rarely Amazon reveals some of these uh, metrics, but whenever it uh, reveals them, it is quite a staggering. Uh, getting one millisecond separation uh, between failovers is amazing. Uh, so in other words, think of it. If you have two availability zones and if you have failovers configured, there's a possibility that uh, you can fail over within one, less than one millisecond and your applications will not even know that there is a failover has happened. So let us dig a little bit detail into the availability zone itself. So if I break it up in the region, it looks like this. That is A, C, A, B and C. For now, let us call them as A, B, C, availability zone A, B, C. And each of those availability zones also have uh, transit centers. What it means is all the internet traffic will flow through this transit center. So this region has one and this will have interconnect between the multiple availability zones. So you do, all your direct connect connections will come and land here and from here it will go to the multiple availability zones itself. So you don't have to uh, remember all of them. Just remember that each region will have multiple availability zones and availability zones are as good as an isolated data center itself. But I don't use the word data centers. The reason is within each availability zone itself, there are logically separated data centers. They are not physically separated, but logically separated. All of them interconnected with cables and uh, network and uh, switches and uh, cooling and power. So as you can see here on my screen, AZA has about uh, four data centers, all of them connected and the blue color uh, denotes a particular type of networking and then the other colors are denotes a particular type of networking. So Amazon has their own internal networking protocols and they network the different data centers uh, in the own way and there is as much resiliency as required. So let us dive a little bit more into the region itself. Now I'm showing you the transit centers. So this is where your external connectivity happens and from here all the data centers are connected now. And if you can notice there are two transit centers, that means that you can, uh, there is a redundancy built into the region itself so you cannot lose your uh, network capabilities for that region that easily. Of course, there are times that regions will also go offline but uh, the chances of both your uh, transit centers going offline and your region going offline are very rare. So I'm going to look a little bit uh, deeper into one of them. Uh, so if you have a clustering like uh, what I've shown here between two availability zones uh, within the same region and if availability zone B goes offline, then your data center in your availability zone A will take care of that application. So whenever you're deploying some application, always recommend to your clients to use multiple availability zones. So this is how you achieve high availability in your cloud. Multiple AZ is the first thing that should come to your mind when somebody says, I want high availability in AWS. So I'm going to uh, uh, show you a little bit more on availability zones itself. The next two or three hours uh, in slides of information is a breakup of the information that I shared just now. So it is a pictorial representation. You can see the transit points uh, all coming here, all the traffic going in here. And from this transit point, it will go to all those people and all those data centers there. And uh, that's it for on this slide. So if you zoom into each one of those regions, you will have a similar architecture, high level architecture like this. So uh, this is the uh, one I told you about. When you want high availability, always use multi AZs. And there are multiple regions, I mean, multiple availability zones are available, not just two. Some regions have five, some regions have three, some regions have two only. There is never just one. So always use multi AZs and spread your workload across multiple AZs. From going forward, from today onwards, I'll be referring to AZs or availability zones. I'm not going to use the word data center. I'm not going to use the word uh, high availability. Use multi AZ. The first thing that should come to your mind is I'm talking about high availability. So remember, I spoke about uh, low latency links. All the data centers are usually connected with uh, less than two milliseconds and it is usually less than one millisecond. So you write a data here A and the A will be replicated here also within a second I finish talking. So that is how fast the replication happens between these two data centers or availability zones. 
so that is what it means of using multiple availability zones so there was uh, somebody who was asking me uh, on how many uh, servers are there in a typical data center um, in the next slide that information is there it's a rough estimate Amazon disclosed some time back it is not the latest estimate so typically if you zoom into any of the availability zones uh, that this is how it looks like like we saw earlier this was a linked to a region and from the region we saw multiple availability zones are there and if we zoom out to one availability zone you will see the multiple data centers are there so we saw this so let's move forward so this is uh, here is the answer to uh, not exactly the latest answer but you can see here a single data center typically has about 50,000 to 80,000 servers so this is remember this is one DC so this one is about 50k so we are talking about 200k of servers in one availability zone and Amazon has multiple availability zones and multiple regions so you calculate how many servers Amazon must be managing altogether so typically this number is a very old number now they have moved this number to very very long uh, point that is very difficult to calculate as well and another thing is amazon uses custom network equipment if you remember i was talking about the network protocols and connections they use everything custom defined which makes sure that uh, the fault tolerance is maintained at the network protocol stack itself and this is the network bandwidth capability that Amazon has provisioned inside its data centers and it is available for each and every one of those data centers within that availability zone so you have a huge amount of bandwidth you don't have to worry about whether Amazon can handle your heavy traffic uh, to put it into perspective uh, Netflix which is a streaming service runs on Amazon and they have not complained about uh, bandwidth problems or network issues so far and Amazon Prime or Amazon.com website itself runs on AWS, so they never had bandwidth problems. So it's a, another pictorial representation of uh, the multiple regions. The top line that you see in each of those boxes, Virginia, Ireland, Tokyo, Oregon, uh, California, these are all the multiple regions. Just a pictorial representation as you can see at the bottom. It's a conceptual drawing. It is not the actual picture. The number of availability bones, uh, zones vary and also the regions are also multiple. So as I said, you don't have to memorize it. Amazon console will have the number of regions available to you and availability zones also inside that also. So just know that it's all available to you and you can choose anything. There is no difference between you choosing an United States, United States region and an Australia region or a Mumbai region. There is a marginal difference in rates in each and every region, but you are not restricted by saying that you are a premium user, you can launch only here. You are a free user, you can launch only here. There is no kind of restrictions like that. You can launch wherever you want. You can consume whichever resources you want. One thing that you want to uh, remember here is Amazon has something called AWS uh, Government Cloud. This data center or this region is specifically designed for uh, US government uh, related workloads uh, there is additional encryption all the data is by default encrypted here and there's a uh, premium charges for using government cloud you as an end customer you can also put your workload on your government cloud that's what AWS go cloud means uh, there is no restriction that only government workloads to be done, but uh, Amazon has built it for additional security. Everything is logged, every traffic is monitored, every traffic uh, uh, comes through is encrypted. So a lot of additional security controls are put in place for government cloud by default. You don't have to do anything, but also you pay for that. So this is, let us say this is uh, $3. If you go ahead and start it in Virginia, it will cost you only $1. So just give a price comparison. That's how it looks like. So if you are working for a government client or a very uh, secure infrastructure is required, you can consider a government cloud as well. So since we're talking about security here, so security is a twofold perspective. Uh, what it means is 
it is a shared responsibility between you and Amazon. Everything that you can see at the bottom of my screen in orange color is your responsibility. That is from this point. So Amazon takes this. Uh, Amazon is responsible for the security of the cloud. What it means is they take care of the availability zone. They take care of the regions. They take care of the registry location. They take care of the compute, the storage, database, networking. They install the protocols. They uh, bug fix it, defect fix it, update it, the patch management, everything they will do. If you are as a customer using Amazon services and creating your data on top of Amazon services, then you are responsible for that. If you want to encrypt it, go ahead and encrypt it. If you want to uh, not store it for more than 10 days and delete it, go ahead and delete it. If you want to protect who wants to have access to what kind of data, use user ID management, group management, access management, and all those things. If you want to protect your resources using firewall configuration, go ahead and set up a VPC or some other uh, hardware HSM modules such as security modules, go ahead and do that. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing here is you should note here operating system. In case if you want to borrow the responsibility from Amazon Compute and do it yourself, patch management and uh, instead of using the latest available images, for example, your application needs Oracle uh, 8 or 9 only, you cannot move to Oracle 12 or operating system Linux has to be kernel 2 point something instead of 3.6 or something. So then in that case, the responsibility of updating your operating system comes into your responsibility. Otherwise, if you uh, if you can use the latest one, go ahead and use the latest images available from Amazon itself. So encryption possible, server side, client side, both are possible. Network traffic level, SSL encryption, TLS, that is also possible. So it is a shared responsibility. Just because you are on the cloud, you are not going to be secure. You and Amazon share this responsibility to together. So remember these keywords if you are going to write a certification. Amazon is responsible for security of the cloud. And as a customer, you are going to be secure, uh, responsible for security in the cloud. When I say in the cloud, it is typically customer data that you are putting there. And so this is how it looks like. For the, all the blue color areas on the top, you, and orange color areas at the bottom, Amazon. So that is how Amazon security looks like. So furthermore, uh, in the security aspects of it, there are a lot of other features available. Uh, for example, there are uh, Amazon has uh, 30 global certifications and compliance uh, already done, pre-configured for you, PC, ATSS, and um, uh, NASCOM, financial, anything that you can think of they have already done that and there are other tooling also available for encryption and logging and all those things uh, the other thing important thing is amazon has a security team available for you to defer by 7 365 days a year but remember this is a paid service if you want to engage them and if you have paid uh, developer support or enterprise level support you can engage this team 24 bar 7. If you feel that your environment is being attacked or probed or DDoSed or there is a, um, let us say, wanna cry type of encryption and you want Amazon's help, then you can engage them assuming you have paid for the service already. And if you see, there's an interesting quote from Capital One, which is a financial institution. They say that they can run securely in the public cloud than we can in our own data centers. Uh, it's a very interesting statement. They say that uh, cloud is more secure than running it in there themselves because it gives them a lot of uh, flexibility when running in the cloud. So you can go ahead and Google this uh, person's statement, Rob Alexander, CIO of Capital One, and they are running a lot of workloads on the cloud. So this is a summary of different tools available in Amazon for security itself, uh, networking level, of VPC. This is a web application firewall. You can decide uh, who has access to what type of uh, URLs. Uh, if you want say, for example, you are a movie company and you want to launch your movies only in the United States or Singapore, you don't want people in India to access it, you can block them at the IP level, saying all IPs from India blocked. They just get a page cannot be displayed or you can say launching soon, coming soon, anything like that. And for encryption, you have a key management service that is KMS or if you have a hardware uh, key fob, if you think of it, which will give you a random generated code. 
you can do that also or you can have server side encryption by SSL or TLS or anything and Amazon takes care of this part that is your service catalog or the cloud config service you can have a configuration management database in the cloud itself and see what configuration is there if anything is changed raise an alarm that is also possible so for identity we spoke about this user id management active directory management or using your corporate directory or google you can use your security features that is available there uh, this is a certification uh, if anybody is interested you can see the url at the bottom of this page aws.amazon.com slash compliance you can go and read all the certifications that amazon has done uh, by default all these security controls apply to the resources that you can consume in the cloud so go ahead and watch it if you want to it's very cool so i'm going to stop here for the day and uh, one moment.